All right, um, so we're looking at uh, static postural distortions today. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take it, start us off with a video actually. Um, Splanus syndrome. Um, and we're gonna kind of take a look at what it means to um, see these like uh, these distortions, right? So uh, before I do, um, the three distortions that we're gonna be looking at today, uh, we're gonna look at what's called Pesplanus syndrome. Uh, which is more commonly referred to as um, pronation distortion syndrome. It's where like basically you are pronating your foot um, and then that's causing distortions that travel up the kinetic chain. So uh, when I say like pronation distortion, right? Um, what we mean is we're seeing like the foot pronate, okay? And that's our, our foundation for everything. In fact, actually here, this is on NASM's blog. Um, they've got, you know, their, their little like breakdown of, of how this works. Um, and so, uh, uh, come on pictures, please. Uh, we can see that like basically someone's foot is flattening and then that's gonna travel up the kinetic chain and cause problems, right? If your foundation's bad, it's it's going to affect everything else. So um, very relevant to kind of what we talked about yesterday. Uh, you know, I showed uh, that little video of just like adjusting the big toe and it kind of had a really big effect like traveling up. We see a lot of people when they're squatting like collapse in on their feet, you know? Um, barbell squat, knees cave in. You'll see like uh, uh, people like, you know, collapse during their barbell squat, you know, obviously like this guy's lifting like a lot of weight. So he's probably in a max, you know, he could be trying to PR that day. Um, even on PR days, I do want to remind everyone, don't compromise your form. <laughs> um, but you know, he's probably doing anything he can to just kind of get the job done. Um, but you will see like how common it is to just like see this kind of collapse here uh, in like a barbell squat scenario. Even like this doesn't look too bad, but um, you know, we're definitely seeing like the knee not line up with the toe. And so this is putting undue stress on certain parts of the kinetic chain, right? Ideally, what we want to see is something more like this, where somebody's like pushing their knees out. Um, and I'm not saying you need your knees to like bow way past your toes either. We just want to see an alignment, um, uh, basically for the, uh, of the knee going straight over your second and third toe. I mean, here's like obviously a very professional power lifter, you know, um, and again, this person's like competing. So it's like, this is not good form by any means, but if you're going to win the Olympics, you know, maybe you sacrifice your form that day. Uh, not the advice we as fitness professionals give, but certainly the, the advice that people would take. Um, but we do, we see like a lot of this sort of like pronation distortion. So if we consider the fact that it starts at the feet and travels up the knees and eventually affects the hip, right? Uh, and this is a really good breakdown right here. You can actually see if we are looking, oh no, it's pixelated. Ah, go to the, let's go to the, oh, it's on Facebook, gross. Uh, <laughs> um, if we look at uh, how this lines up, the reason we like this version here is you can see he's actually, I don't know, this to me seems a little far. Um, he's lining his knee up with like the outside of his foot rather than the knee lining up with the inside of the foot. Ideally what NASM recommends is the second and third toe. So like uh, right between like your, well, I don't know if it's actually everybody's longest, but um, you know, uh, if this is like your big toe, this is your second toe, we kind of want it like right between these two because that's the middle, right? You can kind of see, right? Two over here, one over here. Um, it's the center of your foot. Um, and that's, that's where we want you to line up. Um, so uh, uh, if we draw a line, right? If I just kind of copy this image and we draw a line going straight down, you can see this kneecap is certainly not lining up uh, with the second and third toe, right? It's, it's very much coming inside versus like uh, what we want to see. Um, I, don't, I don't know if they actually do a good job. Yeah, they're not, they're not putting a picture of um, the ideal in here, are they? No. <laughs> um, what we want to see is we want to see like those knees push out uh, and hopefully line up, you know, we look at the the second and third toe here, we want it right in the middle of the foot. His knees should line up uh, somewhere around here, right? Um, and that can happen if we don't see, again, what we're noticing is, you know, this distortion where 
uh, the foot is flattening, right? Uh, the, the tibia is externally rotating. Uh, and then the femur is internally rotating uh, as well as adducting. So um, that's, that's sort of the, uh, the, the complication that we're seeing here, right? Is all of that happens simultaneously. So basically going back to what we said yesterday, right? Um, we know that there's one muscle on one side of the joint uh, that's very tight and another muscle on the other side of the joint that's weaker, right? And so like that big overactive muscle is contracting more than it's supposed to. And then that long skinny underactive muscle is not contracting as much as it's supposed to, right? So what we are seeing that's causing these, these rotations and these adductions and stuff is excessive uh, concentric contractions that are causing the motions by all these overactive muscles and a lack of ease, uh, a lack of concentric contractions on the other side of the joint. All of these muscles over here are concentrically pulling too much. And these muscles are eccentrically being lengthened more than they're supposed to. So how do we fix it? Well, you know, we need to switch from being eccentric to concentric. So we need to strengthen uh, the muscles on this side, right? We're going to like, you know, work to, to tighten these up uh, a bit. Uh, and then over here, we need to stretch, right? We need to stretch out um, these muscles on, uh, on this side. So whatever's concentrically pulling too much, we're going to loosen up. Whatever's not concentrically pulling enough, uh, we are going to strengthen. Uh, and that's, that's what we're going to look down, uh, look at today. So that's pest planus syndrome. Uh, the other ones we are going to look at today uh, are going to be the, we call it lower crossed syndrome, which is the, uh, uh, the excessive anterior pelvic tilt. You can kind of see actually, um, it would be somebody who's sitting uh, and then rather than having uh, like a natural, you know, slight arch, uh, which by the way, having a low back arch, it's, it's kind of a bummer, but uh, it would be so much simpler if our bodies were designed to be perfectly level with our pelvis. Your, your pelvis is supposed to have a slight downward angle, and that's totally okay. Um, but when we see it like very excessive, you can see, um, you know, this, this diagram is kind of showing you, you know, the parts of the spine are gaping and the other one parts are, are grinding, which is, you know, certainly not what we want to see. So the excessive anterior pelvic tilt or the uh, lower crossed syndrome is uh, going to kind of manifest itself in, in sort of two ways. You'll either see the abdomen protrude, or you'll see like just the, uh, the low back excessively arch with the low back arching, the, the more common of the two. So again, we've got really tight muscles on one side of the joint that are pulling too hard and, and weak muscles on the other side of the joint that are not pulling hard enough or are being pulled into length, you know? Um, they're, they're losing the, the arm wrestling match. Um, and then lastly, our third distortion uh, is going to be upper crossed syndrome, where we see the sort of same thing, uh, where it's a very much like a, a big tight X uh, or, a, or, you know, a, a tight line here and a weak line here making an X, right? Um, and that's the low back rounding with the forward head posture that we sometimes see, you know? Um, so uh, obviously there are other distortions out there. Yeah, that's, yeah. Alexis, to be fair, it's anybody that owns a cell phone. <laughs> these freaking things are, you know, I'm not, I don't want to go all Andy Rooney on you guys, but like these things are, are ruining us. <laughs> um, like it even changes the structure of your fingers. Oh yeah, I could see that. <laughs> yeah, like your pinky is way separated from the rest of your fingers now, like for sure. Because <laughs> it kind of like holds it at the end, like at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> huh. my parents used to always uh uh <laughs> like yell at me when i was like well not yelling my parents would like poke fun at me uh when i was a little 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 kid and i had just gotten like a super nintendo like the old snes and um they were like you play that game so much your thumbs are flattening <laughs> and they were like they're like that's why you're so good at these games <laughs> <laughs> yeah that you get dents in your thumb that's <laughs> funny right um fun fact this is just this has nothing to do with today fun fact uh coolest birthday ever until that point when i was a little kid um i could never beat super mario world um because i would just die too much 
uh because i was a kid and you know just yeah, not good enough the game and my parents got up early and just went to level one and played it over and over and over and over and over and over again and got me 99 lives so that i could play yeah. uh that day <laughs> And I was like, this is, my, I, these are the coolest people ever. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, I've got a little video breakdown here um, just to kind of show you the NASM approach to things um, that are going to kind of show you uh, how to work with like a client who has this, this pest planet syndrome. Uh, it's going to move pretty quickly. You guys have probably watched videos like this on the internet before. Um, but uh, uh, this is going to do just a really quick little breakdown um, on what, and then, and then we are going to break it down much more in detail afterwards. Uh, but I think it'll really do a good job of kind of setting the stage for, for what we're talking about today. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, it's the Axiom one, yeah. I need sound here. Of course, you get an ad for, an ad for NASM. <laughs> My whole life is nothing but NASM ads because of, my search history. <laughs> All right, here we go. In this video, we're going to break down pest planus syndrome, what it is and what to look for inside of your static postural assessment. So when it comes to the pest planus syndrome, what we're talking about is this collapsing of the arches and this knock knee or this knee valgus effect. So I know it's not natural for Jess to do it, but Jess, if you don't mind kind of collapsing those feet in. Now, when we're doing our static postural assessment, this ends up being the first place that we look. And one of our three most common uh, postural distortion syndromes inside the NASM textbook and terminology is this pest planus syndrome. And the pest planus, kind of a weird, funny term, but just refers to the collapsing of this arch. All right, so for individuals who may have flatter feet or that rolled in effect, that impacts the stability at the foot and obviously is gonna impact everything else up the kinetic chain. So normally what we're gonna see is we're gonna see collapsing of the arches. You'll also see this adduction, right? Knee valgus, which is the knees adducting in and even internally rotating a little bit, all right? So those will be the primary things that we're looking for. Now this is gonna have an impact as we move into exercises like squats and also single leg moves like lunges because the alignment of this foot and knee and hip is really important for us to be engaging the right muscles. So as for our potential overactive areas, right, these muscles that may have too much signal going to them that we're going to want to calm down and work on better mobility, well, we have a couple of areas. First, our calves, this gastroc and soleus. If we have overactivity in those muscles, it makes it more challenging for us. That can potentially pull us into this unstable position and collapsing inside the foot. Same thing with our AD ductors, our adductor complex, that inner thigh, right? We have attachment here on the inter this uh, internal border, the medial border of our femur and then up into our pelvic and our pubic bones, that can pull us in as well. On top of that, also potentially our hip flexors. Any three of these areas could be an overactive muscle group. We're not gonna know just from the static postural assessment, but it's something that we can look for with some of our movement assessments. And then similar, right? If we see these things show up in some of our other assessments like our overhead squat solutions table with the overhead squat and knees caving in, similar muscles may also be underactive. If we have overactivity in the gastroc and soleus, that may mean underactivity in our shin muscles, our anterior tibialis and posterior tibialis. As the coordination, right? The activation of these muscles and our calves, that's gonna help us control foot position. So we may have underactivity in those muscles. We also might have underactivity in our glute medial and glute max. So the easy solution for these things is we figure what do we do with this once we find out this information and we see it inside of our overhead squat and our other movement assessments is we simply say how can we figure out what muscles may be a little bit overactive and let's try to down regulate that signal. Might be a little bit of myofascial release, some foam rolling, maybe some dynamic mobility exercises like those calf muscles and the AD ductors. And then the opposite side we say how can we turn on and get more signals going to those underactive muscles like the shins and the glutes. Okay, so million videos like that out on the internet, um, and they're they're all pretty good. I mean, honestly, that's a, d a very detailed breakdown. Um, but it does move a little quickly, so let's go ahead and I'm gonna skip very far forward here, um, shoo, 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 shoo. <laughs> all the way through body composition, all the way through cardio, and to posture. Um, but let's go ahead and break down what we mean and how we we sort of approach fixing posture. And um, so obviously we've been in this, this PFT 101 class, right? Um, and it's the only class at all of Sochi in the entire program that I think is actually numbered 
really well. <laughs> the numbering system at Sochi, I'm going to be the first to admit, makes no sense. It's very silly. Apparently, it's like a catalog problem. If we change the number, we can we have to change the catalog. If we change the catalog, we have to apply for research. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it was explained to me once. It sounds lazy. Uh, now my rant is over. Uh, <laughs> but I will say PFT 101, the class we're in right now, um, I love it. You think about like what a 101 class is, right? Uh, it's your foundation classes. It's always like the, it's your first like foundational class. It's, it's almost like the most important class. If you, if you miss your 101 class, you're never going to understand, you know, all the more advanced stuff that kind of comes later. Uh, I love that idea because like our 101 class is built on assessments. It's built on the idea of being able to look at someone and you know understand what's going on with them. That way, when we write a program, it's catered to them, right? If I just kind of you know, uh, let's I wonder. Surely this exists. I'm actually I'm, I'm going to try this on the fly. Workout randomizer. <laughs> let's see if this just random workout generator. How many minutes do we want it to be? We'll say 30 minutes. Let's hit start here. Squats, oh. 32 seconds. Oh. oh, God, it's talking. Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, what a very, very interesting uh, app. So it's just like, it's going to have us do squats for 30 seconds, apparently. Can I skip this forward? Wow, what a, what? This looks like, uh, this looks like proto internet, you know, like back when uh, it was just Very interesting. Let's see if there's a different one. Workout generator, bod bot. There we go. So they kind of just like put a random one together here, right? Uh, let's say we want an at home one. And there's a random one together. Let's see what would happen if uh, we lower the difficulty down. There's a random one. Here's the thing, guys. I, I'm not even really looking too much at these workouts. I'll bet they're fine. If somebody did them, they might get very decent results, you know, um, because any physical activity is is valuable in its own way, you know, but every one of those workouts is going to burn calories, um, which like is going to strengthen your cardiorespiratory system. It's going to have positive benefits for sure. Um, but they're all very general, right? They're all, you know, throwing darts at a dartboard uh, sort of approach to fitness. And that's fine for calorically burning the right amount of calories and even just being like a little muscular or like, you know, a little physically active. Um, it's fine. But what it lacks is, you know, looking specifically at uh, what's going on with someone, because who knows, maybe you have, you know, there are a lot of opposite problems out there. Like me, for instance, I don't have a problem with anterior tilting, uh, but I do have a problem with posterior tilting, which is uh, not going to be in your regular textbook, unfortunately, but you will see that distortion uh, when you get to Mo's like capstone section. But if you look at an anterior pelvic tilt uh, versus a posterior pelvic tilt, you can see they are the opposite problems, right? One is low back arching and the other one is low back rounding. Um, so I've got like the old man, I call it old man butt, where it's like the just a flat back and just like uh, Jeff Foxworthy, actually, my parents love Jeff Foxworthy, that like redneck comedian. Um, and uh, he has this joke about how like when you're an old man, you have no butt anymore because at this point you've scratched it off. And he's like, it's like a frog stood up and put on pants. <laughs> and I love that. That visual is perfect because I'm like, yeah, that's a that's a flat back posture, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like um, and I feel like that. Right. You can kind of see she's got the posterior tilt here. Right. Um, versus the anterior tilt, which is sort of the, uh, I like to call that Instagram booty, right? Um, where there's sort of the exaggerated low back arch. So like both of these are, you know, a distortion that's, that's going to affect the spine, right? Um, here's sort of a diagram kind of representing these problems. Oh, actually, that's not quite what I wanted. Um, uh, hold on. Let's see if I can find one with little spinal discs, you know? Um, Eh, not so much. Okay, well, this is a great picture though that has them both. Um, but you can imagine like, again, if we talk about like just like gaping and grinding, right? One part of the spine, if you have like an anterior tilt, right? The front 
of your spine is going to be gaping and the back is going to be grinding. And if you have a posterior tilt, the back is going to be grinding and the front is going to be gaping, right? Like, or uh, yeah, flip it, <laughs> right? So like either way, it's dysfunctional. It's not, it's not going to be good. Uh, but these are opposite problems. So if I had two clients, two clients who both have like uh, uh, pelvic tilt problems, one's an anterior tilter and the other one's a posterior tilter, uh, and I give them both the same program, you know, I go to a workout randomizer, I find a workout in a magazine that I think I was like, that's cool, you know, or just some standard ass program that some other trainer wrote. And I just give it to both those clients. They're neither of them is going to be getting like the best results that are, are designed for them, you know? Um, and it's what kind of leads to a lot of people who have maybe hired trainers in the past. And they're like, I don't know. I mean, it was good. I just never really got to where I felt like I was supposed to be getting. It just didn't feel like my trainer was, you know, I just felt like I was showing up for my sessions. Right. I hate hearing that when people talk about like working with their trainers, because ideally it should feel customized. It should feel like it's, you know, their time is spent for them. So these two people does, you know, need to have opposite programs. Um, now, how are we going to know what to do with them? Well, again, that's where the fitness assessment comes in. So in my opinion, it's, it's this, the, the fitness assessment is our most foundational information. And it's why we want to spend so much time kind of understanding it. Um, so every movement needs to have like a base of, of support from which it, you know, not only generates, but also accepts force. So, you know, when it concentrically does stuff or when it eccentrically does stuff. And so like that baseline, uh, is known as our posture, right? So posture is the alignment of your movement system, right? The alignment of your body. Um, and that allows you to have like a good foundation from which to, you know, move around. Uh, I did this with a couple of you guys uh, uh, last time we all met up, but just try rounding your shoulders and keep them rounded. And now try to raise your arms up overhead. It's literally impossible, right? Like you're going to be hitting there's a little notch on the top of your humerus uh, and you're going to grind it into your, uh, your scapula or your collarbone. It's going to just go whoop, and it gets stuck and you literally can't raise it any higher. But if you roll your shoulders, you know, down and back, all of a sudden it becomes very easy to raise your arms up overhead, you know? Um, and that's what we mean when we say posture. If you want to move through the appropriate range of motion, you need the alignment of your human movement system. You need the alignment of your kinetic chain to be in, you know, proper alignment, you know? Um, so posture is going to ensure that we're able to do this. It also gives us a uh, neuromuscular efficiency, which is a term that we, we talk about a lot, right? Neuromuscular efficiency um, is, uh, it's the ability to recruit the right muscle at the right time for the right amount of force in the right plane of motion. <laughs> um, so it's a lot of things going right. Um, but it's, it's basically, you can think of it as like using the correct muscles to do the right job. Uh, again, I always use this as an example, but if I need to get like a screw into the wall, I can hammer it into the wall with a hammer. I'll get it in there eventually, you know? <laughs> um, but it's not going to be very effective. You know, it's just going to be kind of grinding into the drywall. It's not really screwing into anything, you know? Um, uh, I could use a screwdriver to pound in a nail eventually, if I just use the hard end on the other side and just slam it like this, but I'm probably gonna slide, I'm gonna cut my hand, you know? Give me a million reasons uh, why I shouldn't do that. So we wanna use the right muscles at the correct time. Whereas like we often find ways to use the wrong muscles at the right time, you know? Um, if we are out of alignment, our body will find ways um, to move through ranges of motion um, that it's not so good at moving through. Um, so uh, quickly taking just like a little pause here. Uh, this is something that I put in here uh, that isn't in your textbook, at least explicitly. Um, but here's, in my opinion, three steps to being a successful personal trainer, <laughs> or at least three steps to effectively training clients. Um, first, the, and this, by the way, is something I've modified from like the three steps to problem solving. I don't know if anybody in here has ever studied problem solving, but it's really kind of an art form. Um, you know, uh, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful art form that you should totally, uh, uh, take time to study just in your life in general, um, just get better at problem solving, you know, um, and, and first things first, uh, when it comes to any problem solving method, we always start with identifying the problem, right? Like if I just, in fact, I can kind of Google this, let's hear, 
three steps to problem solving. Uh, and you'll see it's very, 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 very simple. Um, first thing you need to do is you need to understand, then strategize, then implement. That's one way to say it. Uh, yeah, that's fine. That's a good way to put it. Um, but what I like to say is like, first you need to identify the problem accurately. Okay, so like first figure out what's actually at the root cause of like whatever it is. If you are not happy with how much money you're making, right? First thing you need to do is like figure out the root cause. Is it because maybe you're lacking a skill that will get you, um, you know, to where you wanna be? Uh, is it because maybe you're spending too much money? Uh, is it because of where you live? Maybe there just isn't enough opportunity, right? Um, million different things that can, can be caused by that, right? Um, uh, maybe you're not happy with, like, maybe you just feel really like tired and worn down throughout the day. That's a classic one. Uh, first, is it because you're not getting enough coffee? Probably not. Uh, or is it because you're maybe not getting enough sleep? Uh, maybe you are getting plenty of sleep. Maybe you're getting too much sleep. Sometimes that can make us feel a little groggy. Um, maybe you're stressed out in life. Maybe you're overtraining in the gym. A million different things. So you're going to have to do a little investigation to figure out and identify the actual problem, right? Well, that's what we are first doing with our clients. We are going to identify problems through integrated fitness assessments. Um, I've had clients say like, you know, they're just like, oh, I'm just bad at cardio, right? And then I'll put them through like a cardiovascular assessment and they'll do fairly well. I mean, maybe, you know, there's certainly room for improvement. Maybe this person's not exactly like a marathon runner, but like, I'll put them through a, a cardio assessment. I'm like, your heart rate's recovering well. And I'll, I'll do multiple. Cause like, that's confusing for someone to say that they're very bad at something and then perform very well. It's contradicting. So I'm like, uh, I think you might be identifying the wrong problem here. And then I'll be like, well, let's go show me what your one, you know, they're like, well, I just, I can't even run a mile. I'm like, okay, well, show me what your mile run looks like. And then they'll crank it. And they have this kind of like, they're just, if they were like a professional run, if they were a racer, um, they would be doing just, they, they, have, they have a terrible race strategy. Uh, when you're racing, you kind of want to keep up with everybody. You want to stay in the middle of the pack until the very end of the race where you do what's called your kick. And your kick is, that's where you take off and, you know, you want to be the fastest at the end right? Um, this person was coming hard out the gate. So then they were getting ex exhausted. And I was like, here's the thing. You're not nearly as bad at cardio as you think you are. You're just not particularly good at running because you have a bad strategy. You learn how to pace yourself. Um, and there, you know, so that's first things, the, the step one is identifying the problem accurately. And we can't identify any problems accurately unless we do a fitness assessment. So identify any goals or any issues related to your client's structural and their functional capacity. So we're gonna identify what's going on with our client. This is why we do fitness assessments. Uh, now, the second part is actually pretty easy. Uh, honestly, and this is the hardest part. This is the hardest part of all problems. So, well. I think it's the hardest part of problem solving. The implementing part can also be hard. It's the, this is the uh, the hardest one to understand, I think. Um, step two, we just need to solve the problem through integrated program design. So our next step, is once we know what's going on with our client, they got an anterior tilt, they got a posterior tilt, they got knees caving in, they got shoulder rounding, whatever it happens to be. Well, now we just need to solve that problem. We need to write a program that's going to address that, right? Uh, and when I say solve, you might think like the problem's gone. I actually don't mean it that way. I mean it like, uh, uh, I mean it in the same way that like you solve the math problem in your head when you're like trying to figure out like a tip at a restaurant. You know what I mean? Right, you do it, you're like, and then you write it down, you know? <laughs> like the solving part happens up here. The solution is just generating the solution. We haven't implemented the solution yet. We're just coming up with it, right? So we write the program. I've written the program. That's me solving the problem. I'll implement the program in step three. Like we'll train it, we'll do the program, right? But step two is just solving the problem, right? So interpret the data that you collected and then write down a program in order to address that dysfunction. Take a look at NASM's uh, website or that little blog entry that we saw. Uh, where'd it go? Uh, oh, it's on here. Oh, it was lost syndrome that's what i google oh nasm i literally just saw you all right or was it oh is pest planet syndrome 
Yeah, too many names for these darn syndromes. There it is, the Quizlet one, that one. All right, so we go to NASM's little like blog entry here, scroll all the way down and take a look. They've solved the problem of the, the pronation distortion, the knees cave in, feet turn out thing. Here's a program that they wrote to fix it. So now that I've written that for my client, they've got it. And you know, now my job is to move into step three, which is implement the solution, right? Can you show it again, um, Brad? Sorry. What's that? Question? Can you show the, the program again? Uh, hold on one second. Oh, my volume is so low. I was, thought I was going crazy. Uh, sorry, go ahead. One, one more time, Marja. I didn't hear you. Can you show the program uh, designer again? Yeah. yeah, right here. Thank you. So just so you know, this is actually the, uh, um, this is actually the uh, corrective exercise approach. Yeah. Um, so you'll notice it says inhibit length and activate integrate instead of saying like warm up movement prep resistance. Um, we're going to do ours different today um because we're gonna do sort of the the standard approach um this guys if you don't know because you're new uh this is a corrective exercise program uh which is like what you'll get in capstone the ces um the ces certification uses this template it just looks different um uh we're gonna do sort of a, a standard approach today so my programs are gonna look uh a little bit more like this um warm up movement prep and then cool down um rather than this version here okay. um but yeah um so uh that's the solving of the problem right we're gonna uh once we've interpreted the data we're gonna write a program to address it um so we are gonna look at one side of the joint and be like that's tight and we're gonna look at the other side of the joint and be like that's weak and I'm going to fix that through like you know, foam rolling, stretching, things like that. I'm going to fix that through like strengthening exercises. Uh, and I write a program to reflect that. Step three, the easy part, implement the solution. Train your clients. That's it. Implementing the solution is doing whatever it is you, you wrote. You know, um, It's showing up to the gym and putting in the hours. That's the implementation. Um, so uh, uh, we're going to implement our solutions by training our clients, right? For whatever it was that we we kind of came up with um, in terms of uh, uh, what we wrote, right? Um, so um, this, by the way, like I said, this really does kind of work for everything in your life. I I love whenever I'm like really like frustrated by something, I'll come up with a plan of action, and I'm like three steps. What's holding me back from doing this thing? Uh, how do I fix that? Now I got to do it, you know, and I oftentimes like writing it down like that and putting it, I got a little whiteboard actually hidden like behind the monitor here. <laughs> um, that's where I like to write down like my like three steps and it's like, do this. I'm like, all right, now that's written down. I feel pressured to do it. Um, that's like my solution for everything. Everybody's going to be a little bit different, you know, um, but that's why uh, we, we try all kinds of stuff out. Um, so uh, things to remember about fitness assessments. You'll hear me say this again in like a couple of days, but our fitness assessments are not di not designed to diagnose any conditions. It's not what we're doing. Um, our job is to look at our client's structural status, right? That will give us a starting point uh, to work from, and then we can you know fix these things slowly over time. So this isn't in, in fixing a medical examination. If our client is like, yeah, I just you know I have like heart problems and things like that. And, like if you talk to your doctor about that and it's like, yeah, once years ago and, you know, I've been trying to get more physically active since it's like probably not super safe to train that client, you know, um, so make sure you always get like a doctor's, you know, examination or doctor's permission to exercise before you ever do any of this stuff. Um, you know, this is not replacing medical information. Um, uh, but the program that you design is going to be uh, uh as good as the assessment that you perform, right? You're never going to be able to like write a program that is actually custom to your client without doing an assessment first. Um, and if you get very, very, very good at fitness assessments, um, uh, it's always one of my favorite like selling techniques in order to just like, you know, have a, a successful career. Like I said, you sometimes have to do sales depending on where you find yourself as a trainer. Um, one of my favorite things to do would be to like do the assessment take my client back over to the desk and in five minutes, write a routine to address that, 
right in front of them and be like, so I saw this, so this is going to be very good for that. I saw this, this is going to be really good for that. Remember how you felt this, this is going to be really good for that. And I would just finish that and write it all out in like five minutes and I would give it to them. Um, so that made me feel like even if this person didn't sign up for training, I still put something good out into the world. Um, they're getting a chance. Maybe they can do that program without me. It's a bummer that I don't get to train them. It's going to be better if I did, but at least I still feel like, you know, I'm not like a sleazy salesperson, you know, um, I'm putting something very good out into the world, but a lot of times people will be like, you're able to just like write that right. right? And they're like, Oh, I want to train with this guy, you know, <laughs> like, like that's, and it was a terrific sales technique, um, without being a sales technique. Uh, and we'll talk more about that once this course is wrapped up and we go into our, our professional development class. Um, so we're going to look for some main predictable patterns of muscle imbalance. Okay. We're going to look for some most common versions of postural distortions. Okay. Um, so when it comes to, when I say a muscle imbalance, right? Again, we're looking at where there's one muscle on one side of the joint that is a little tighter than it's supposed to be. And another muscle on the other side of the joint uh, that is looser than it's supposed to be. Now, this could be due to scar tissue, right? Maybe this muscle over here got injured. So it tightened up because it has scar tissue, or it could just be because maybe we use that muscle too often. You know, uh, one of my roommates has like the tightest calf muscles I've literally ever seen. Uh, and it's funny, like I'll spot him around the house walking on the, like his tiptoes. And I'm like, Hey, heel to toe. <laughs> I'm like, get that freaking heel down. Right. Because like, he's very good at plantar flexion, but he struggles with dorsiflexion. So he's got one muscle on one side. That's just a habit, you know, and that habit has resulted in an anatomical shift over the years, but we do, we see tight muscles on one side and weak muscles on the other. It could be due to poor posture from maybe like a lifestyle, uh, repetitive movements, lack of daily movement. There's a lot of different things that can kind of contribute to one muscle tightening up and another muscle loosening up. But either way, we know how to increase the muscular activity to one side of the joint through doing strengthening exercises. You know, that's what we're gonna address over here. And we know how to like kind of shut down those overactive muscles. Um, one thing that we haven't talked a lot about in this course just yet uh, is the idea of static stretching. Um, static stretching, those big, long 30 second duration stretches um, are very good at turning our muscles off. They actually decrease our neuromuscular activity. Um, so if I'm trying to loosen up a muscle, I need to make sure that I'm holding my stretches long enough so I can decrease that neuromuscular activity there. Um, so like I said, we're going to look at three most common postural distortions today. These are static distortions. Um, this is just a client's like static structural status. Um, normally, or not normally, uh, uh, beyond this, we are also going to see like movement distortions. We'll make our clients squat through like a specific range of motion and that will put extra stress. You know, maybe something doesn't break down just standing. Maybe they look like they have really great posture. And then you make them squat and we put more stress on certain parts of the kinetic chain and that's where it breaks down, you know? Um, and that's kind of how assessments work. It's like, we start with one, if we see anything, great. We write it down, uh, but maybe we don't see anything. So it's like, all right, let's give you a slightly more advanced one. Let's give you a slightly more advanced one than that. Advanced one more than that. Until eventually it's like, you know what? Your posture is great. <coughs> or we eventually see breakdown. So um, three main distortions today, pronation distortion, that's going to be uh, the feet collapsing in, knees caving in distortion, right? Uh, lower crossed syndrome, which is the anterior pelvic tilt, uh, and upper cross syndrome, which is the shoulder rounding and forward head posture. So um, let's look at this one here first. Oh, I knew it. Okay, hold on. <laughs> All right, so ideally what we should be seeing um, when we look at someone's posture, like I said earlier, uh, we wanna see their knee line up with their second and third toe, which is certainly not what's happening here, right? We can see their knee is very much, uh, both of their knees are very much lining inside. What we would love to have happen is we would have it lined up like right here. This is actually one of the reasons why a lot of trainers recommend 
a slight foot turn out posture when someone is doing uh, like a barbell squat, right? And that's going to be different for everybody. Everybody's posture is going to be a little bit different depending on how much knees cave out action you need uh, during that squat. But if we look at like squat, uh, we look at like barbell squat posture, like this girl here, she's crushing it, you know? Um, whoops. Uh, you can actually see that's like her, she's got external rotation. So like, I can't draw like a straight line perfectly um, because this is like, she's 3D and I'm 2D. <laughs> you know, there's a flat image, but you can see, look at, look at how her knees facing sort of at an angle away. That's lining up directly with those toes. She's got a pretty wide stance here. You know, um, this wide stance to me, shows that like, you know, her femur is, is much better at what we call antiversion, which is sort of a, the external rotation there. Not everybody's going to be like that. Some people will have, um, like this guy's also got a very, very wide stance. Um, other people might have a little bit more of a narrow stance, but it's still very good alignment. You know, the knee itself is traveling over the second and third toe. That actually might be a little KVN. -y. Um, this guy is a little bit more narrow. Like this guy is, could be like taller than that gal, but like, look at like, he's still very much in alignment there. Everybody's going to be a little bit different. There really is no um, perfect like width for squats. A lot of trainers, we all kind of jump to, you know, feet shoulder width apart. That's the one you always hear, right? Feet shoulder width apart. Um, that could be true for a lot of people. Generally, uh, as a rule of thumb, it actually works pretty decently. I will use that note a lot to start. But then everybody's pelvis is a, is a different width. Um, women naturally have a wider pelvis than men, for instance. Um, but depending on like the shape of the, the socket of like how their femur is sitting in there, some people need more external rotation and a wider stance. Some people need less external rotation and a more narrow stance. So another video I do wanna show you guys today uh, that's gonna kind of explain that. Uh, squat, stance, and... <laughs> so, uh, is it this one? Yeah, it's that one. Yeah, it's this one. Okay. Um, so another squat university video. I know I show a lot of these, but this guy's the best. <laughs> Take care of your skin, my guy. It's not even that hard. Oh my God. I'm about to... ah. No, 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 no. If you're struggling. And get down, get up. And get... Hey guys, thanks so much for stopping by Squat University. In today's video, I'm going to show you how your anatomy, specifically your hip anatomy, can change your squat stance from being 100% straightforward or extremely toed out. All right, so here's the first thing. We have to do a little anatomy lesson. Now, the way in which most people, so we'll call it textbook anatomy of uh, your hips, your femur connects to your pelvis at a slight angle forward. However, some people don't have that textbook anatomy alignment of their femur. Their hips may be more angled forward, which is called antiversion, or their hips may be naturally more flat in their connection, which is called retroversion. And depending on the anatomy variation you have, it can have a dramatic effect on what feels most natural for you to squat, which is then going to change how well you move and how much weight you can lift, because you want to find the squat stance that's most optimal for your body. Now today, let's talk about how to screen for the difference between antiversion and retroversion, something that you can do at home. You don't have to go see a medical professional to do this screen, okay? So I'm gonna have Christine come on over and she is gonna start by sitting on the edge of the bench. Now, all you have to do in this is look at the difference between internal rotation and external rotation. Now, someone with antiversion will have internal rotation excessive in two positions. So by the way, really quickly, uh, just because sometimes this does get confusing, um, this is, let me take that back slightly, that is internal rotation. He's not saying, uh, he's not saying hip here, um, which could be confusing a little bit, um, but what he's referring to, we, we are talking from the perspective of the hips here. So um, you can see this is internal hip rotation. Yeah, I know that the foot's going this way. And if that's what you're like paying attention to, because it's the thing that's most moving, you're like, is that not external? No, no, <laughs> we're not looking at the foot. We're looking at the hip. He's pulling the foot out. 
that's what's causing the internal hip rotation. Uh, external hip rotation would be if he uh, swung the foot this way and that caused uh, the femur to go out that way. So just remember that guys, um, this is an example. What we're seeing here is internal rotation. He's talking about the hip joint. Um, so that's internal hip rotation. Let's go. We'll have internal rotation excessive in two positions. Really so we have internal rotation and external. What you're gonna look for is, is it excessive in one position? So we have a lot of internal rotation and we have very little external rotation. Now that's only one clue. Let's go over on your stomach. We have to also look at your body's ability to produce hip internal and external in a prone position lying on your stomach. In this position, she has, again, very limited external rotation and excessive internal rotation. If this is you and you have excessive internal rotation in limited external and seated and limited external and excessive internal also in a prone position or laying on your stomach, we can say it's because you have antiversion in your hips. So your pelvis is more aligned at an angle. What this means is that because your pelvis is more set forward in the angle, come over here, of the femur in which it articulates, it is natural for you to squat 100% usually straight forward. This is the way in which her body aligns the hips and everything most optimally. So if- Oh yeah. If she were to try to squat with her toes turned out excessively, try to squat down. It's not going to feel very well. She's not going to get very deep in her squat. It can lead to a lot of knee not issues. Does, like, see how much her knees are caving in. Over a lot of hip issues. It's not going to be suited for her anatomy. So understanding what her anatomy is allows us to find the most optimal position for her squat. Now, let's talk about the opposite end. Ed, come on over here. Again, we're going to look in two positions, seated and prone. So in this position, let's look at Ed's internal rotation. Not much. Let's look at his external rotation, a lot. So he's got very limited internal and very excessive external. Now let's also look in prone, because remember we have to look at both positions. So in this position, internal, very limited, external, excessive. So again, he fit the pattern that in both positions, seated and prone on his stomach, he had the same amount. He had very limited internal and very excessive external. What that means is that Ed fits the profile for someone who is retroverted in the way in which his femur aligns with his pelvis is very flat angle. What this means is that Ed being very retroverted naturally has a body that's built to have a little bit more of a toe out position, maybe 30 degrees, maybe even 35 degrees. So squat down in this position. This is the way in which his body naturally moves most optimally. His body's aligned to produce the most force. His back is staying flat in this position. If he were to try to adopt a very straightforward foot position, nope. he would actually close <laughs> off his hip joint much sooner. Squat down. Obviously you can see he can't <laughs> squat any deeper. It limits his squat depth because being very externally rotated uh, or being very internally rotated now because he's retroverted, he's just smashing his femur into the front side of his pelvis. Basically he's impinging on himself. So one of the reasons people develop hip impingements is because they are adopting a squat pattern that is not right for their anatomy. And actually by finding out, hey, I have a lot of retroversion to my hips, maybe opening up my toes a little bit to allow my femurs to move in their more ideal and optimal range can allow him to not only squat deeper, but have a better feeling squat and produce a little bit more power. So that is the difference between antiversion and retroversion. Now, here's the big thing to understand. If when doing the seated in the prone test, you didn't find that it was the exact same. So you maybe had excessive external rotation while seating, uh, while in the seated pattern. But then when you went up and you laid on your stomach, it was different, it flipped sides. What that means is that your body probably doesn't have retroversion or antiversion. You lie within that textbook normal range. 
for those type of people, your natural position will likely be a slight toe out angle during your squat. It's not 100% straightforward. It's not extremely wide. It's gonna be within that slight toe out position, maybe seven to 12 to 15 degrees or so. That's what's gonna give you the optimal alignment in your squat stance for you to move as well as possible and keep your body safe. So I hope you guys like today's quick Squat University video on YouTube. So, um, so that's kind of a, a, a something that we also need to take into account for. However, in a standing normal position, we should be able to stand with our toes pointed straight forward, right? Like all of this was very much referred to like when you bring your femur through like flexion, right? Like as you are sitting into the low portion of a squat, your femur is going through hip flexion, right? The knee is coming up towards the chest, basically. Um, if you can't, you know, uh, even stand with toes pointed forward, that is what we're going to refer to as pronation distortion syndrome. Now, why is it called pronation distortion syndrome? Or why is it called pes planus syndrome? Um, well, here's our textbook sort of definition here. Uh, it is a static posture that is characterized by flattened or externally rotated feet and adducted and internally rotated knees. So um, if we're looking at the feet, what we're seeing is just right here, right? You can see this is the feet are flattening down, right? We are seeing uh, an external rotation of the tibia and internal rotation of the femur as well as adduction of the femur. And you guys will notice this, if you just try this right now, if you just stand up and stand with your feet like at shoulder width apart, like totally neutral position, you know, um, just try to bring your knees together by itself. You'll notice it's impossible to just like, your, your hip is in charge of, we, we call this adduction, right? And abduction, so adduction, abduction. It can do that, but that's a frontal plane movement and your knee joint is a hinge joint. So because it's a hinge joint, right, it's stuck like this. It can go this way, but it can't go side to side. Your knee cannot adduct. There's no adduction that can happen in this joint here, but obviously we have adduction at the hip. So what happens in response? Well, the knee rotates in, which is why this part of the knee has to rotate out in response because i can't adduct my knee like just try that right now guys like you know if you just try to like bring your thigh in you'll notice look at my kneecap and i'm gonna hold, I'll hold it here so you guys can actually you know what here hold up screen share and then you can really see me um so if i if i point to my kneecap pointing straight forward right now and then i just bring my thigh in it's pointing over there now it rotated so then the other part of me rotated out in response because my body's trying to find balance, right? If I come in in one direction, I gotta go out in the other direction. So that's the pronation distortion syndrome that we're talking about, right? So now we've got a list of probable overactive muscles, right? That are gonna be our really tight muscles here um, that we need to stretch, right? Um, so this is going to be the la uh, the gastrocnemius, and actually I'm going to pull up the new version of this. Uh, 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 scroll down. I'm going to modify this slightly. Downloads. By the way, this is on NASM's website. If you go to their downloads tab, um, you can actually find under the assessments form. Just go to static and dynamic posture assessments. Here's where you're marking it. It's like, yeah, I saw that. You know, I didn't see that. Yes, I saw. All right, but uh, down here is the answers. So our pest planus syndrome is going to be listed as overactive in the gastrocnemius. That's your calf muscles, particularly the lateral side, um, but really kind of all of it. Uh, the soleus. Uh, the adductors is obviously going to be a big one. And they're listing this as hip flexors, which I don't love. Um, it really should say like the, the TFL slash IT band, 
<clears throat> it's not like the rectus femoris is probably not causing this. Uh, and they took out the biceps femoris uh, in the, the new version. But me, honestly, I put it in here. It really, it really belongs in here. Um, but these are the probable overactive muscles that are on your official list um, that you'll want to have like memorized to pass your test. Me personally, I really do think the biceps femoris belongs on there. For those of you who don't know, the biceps femoris is this little hamstring muscle behind the thigh back here. And it's the one that does this external tibia rotation. Uh, it's the one that's responsible for doing this. Um, so that's, that's, it definitely belongs on that list. Um, you can feel that muscle fire, by the way, if you want to, if you want proof of what I'm saying right now, uh, just go like this, bend your knee, place your hand right here on the lateral outside part of your hamstring, and then turn your foot out like that. You will feel that muscle contract. Um, which is, you know, exactly, exactly what we are seeing right here. Um, but this is the official list right here. The, the gastrocnemus, particularly the lateral aspect of it, um, so the outside part of it, the soleus, um, which are two of your calf muscles, okay? So if we look at the, the anatomy of those, um, here are the two muscles that we're talking about. So your gastrocnemus is your calf muscle, okay? It's the big, fat, meaty part of your calf muscle, right? Like when you see like big old calves, those are, those are the gastrocnemus that you're seeing. The soleus is there as well, but it's the bottom portion down here. Now, both of these muscles are responsible for plantar flexion, right? So both of them are in charge of uh, this. Point the toe away, right? Um, so if you are not particularly good at pointing your toe away, uh, as you try to like squat, for instance, right? Like if I squat down, my knees travel forward. I'm going into, I'm going to end up in a position like this, pointing, trying to see, right? Where my knees traveling forward and I've got this really sharp angle here. If I'm not so good at that, my foot's going to stay there. So then because my foot doesn't come up, it's got to find some other way to allow for that range of motion. So what it'll do is it'll often just turn itself out like that. Because if we actually look at the front of the ankle here, and we look at some of these little bones here, uh, it's easier to turn the foot out and that takes the stretch away from these really tight muscles. These muscles don't want to stretch, so what they do is they just turn the foot out in response rather than stretching, right? That is a tight muscle that we need to loosen up so that we can get that range of motion back. So both of those muscles are gonna be on our stretch them list, right? Um, and they do work slightly differently. Uh, the gastrocnemus is usually responsible for plantar flexion with a straight leg. Uh, and then if you have a bent knee, the soleus is more responsible for that. That's why you feel uh, differences in the stretch uh, when you are, um, oh, I'm sorry. I just described it during the stretch. Sorry. Your gastrocnemus is responsible. Your gastrocnemus is responsible for pointing your toe with a bent leg and your soleus is responsible for pointing the toe with a straight leg. That's why when you're stretching the gastrocnemus, usually you'll do that straight leg calf stretch. And when you're stretching the soleus, you'll do the bent knee. So by bending the knee, you'll feel the stretch come from here down to here. Uh, sometimes you'll, people mistake that for like an Achilles stretch. Uh, and that's because the Achilles tendon is where both of those muscles are inserted. There's your Achilles tendon right about there. You can't see, they're not drawing it in a different color here, but that's where it would be. Um, so uh, now let's go ahead and flip straight to the other side of the joint. You know, if we know that, you know, again, it's, it's you know, that, that, big tight muscle here. That's all the tight muscles. So now we need to switch to the other side of the joint and talk about what to strengthen, right? So our probable underactive muscles that we're going to want to strengthen, right? That is going to be right on the other side of the joint of our calves. We're going to see what's called your anterior tibialis, okay? So the anterior tibialis is this little shin muscle right here. Ah, 
buttons. Um, so it lives just on the front of your shin. So it's in charge of dorsiflexion, okay? So plantar flexion, pointing your toe, that's what your calves do, uh, is the opposite. We're doing, we're sort of too good at that. So we want to get better at dorsiflexion. We want to get better at pulling our toe back towards us. So we're going to work on that one right there. We're also going to see the posterior tibialis. And this one lives behind the anterior tibialis. That's why it's called pot. Ooh, I closed it. Um, this one, uh, let's see anterior, let's see if I can get both. <laughs> Come on, internet. Yeah. So uh, there's the posterior tibialis there. It's on the back side of the knee, actually, and it wraps around. So both of those tibialis muscles, both of those shin muscles, there's the anterior front on the back, the posterior one kind of threads behind. Uh, it's sort of like, honestly, the posterior one's kind of pinched under your calf muscles, actually. Um, but both of those tibialis muscles need to be strengthened, okay? Um, then we go back to our list. We see the adductor complex, which is in charge of shocker of the year, hip adduction. <laughs> so they're named after it, right? Um, so that's a very tight muscle that we need to stretch, right? Um, so uh, we need to strengthen our abductors. So what muscle is primarily responsible for hip abduction? Uh, that is going to be your gluteus medius. Um, so the gluteus medius is your side butt muscle. Okay. Uh, it's the muscle right here on the side of the butt. Uh, well, they got, that's the gluteus maximus being hidden by it. There it goes. So it lives underneath your gluteus max. You can see it here in this picture. Um, this is the gluteus maximus here. And then underneath it on the, the pelvis itself, that's the gluteus medius. Uh, and that muscle all by itself, you can actually see, um, runs and it grabs the femur here. So when it pulls, it swings the femur out that way, which go back to our picture, right? Look, we're caving in too much. We want to swing the, the femur back out the other way. So we need the gluteus medius instead of the gluteus, I'm sorry, instead of the adductors to be nice and strong. And that will draw us back, you know, uh, these inner thigh muscles here, my adductors are pulling me in and my gluteus medius will pull me back out. And that's how I'm gonna fix this caving in posture. Uh, then our gluteus maximus is gonna be the next one. Gluteus maximus is the one we already kind of talked about. That's the one right here. That's the big king of muscles. Uh, uh, it's your main butt muscle there. Now you might be thinking your gluteus maximus is in charge of hip extension, which is going this way, which doesn't have anything to do with like the caving in thing. Uh, and you'd be right. It is mostly in charge of this. However, one other thing that that gluteus maximus does, and you can feel this if you place your hand on your booty, uh, take your hip and just turn your foot, like you're standing straight and then just like turn your foot away. It is also in charge of hip external rotation, okay? So it is going to swing your hip open, which remember, we are swinging our hip closed um, because of the TFL. So that's why I don't like the fact that they say hip flexors here. I would love them to be a little bit more specific. The big hip flexor that's responsible for that is your TFL. So the tensor fascia latte this little muscle right here that eventually becomes your IT band. Um, it's here to the femur here. So it's the same place actually, right? They're, they're both run into the same area. One of them internally rotates the hip. That's the TFL. The gluteus maximus externally rotates the hip. That's why it's the opposite. Um, so I don't love that they just said hip flex. I mean, I get it, um, but we need to like stretch out this muscle here, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and put that one on. The, oh, I already got it on the list. So now we can kind of see what we need to strengthen. So let's go ahead and put arrows for that, right? If I strengthen my uh, uh, anterior tibialis, what's that going to do? Well, that's going to allow me to swing, and my posterior tibialis, that's going to allow me to swing back out this way. 
if I strengthen my gluteus medius, that's going to allow me to pull the hip back out that way. If I strengthen my gluteus maximus, that's going to help me swing the hip externally, right? And then all of that's going to have this positive effect because I'm working on all of these muscles here and here, that's gonna turn me back to neutral. So I'm gonna put some lines here, Ooh, some lines to kind of represent what I mean. All right, so the anterior tibialis and the posterior tibialis are both uh, going to have this positive effect here. Uh, the gluteus medius is going to have this positive effect uh, here and the gluteus maximus is going to be responsible for that there. And then all of it's going to kind of affect this, which is in the middle. So the tightness is coming from the gastric nemus and soleus. They're both sort of causing this problem. Uh, the adductors are causing this problem. And the hip flexors are causing this problem. Um, so that's how I'm going to sort of fix this, right? Again, I've got my my list of things to stretch and I've got my list of things to, to strengthen, right? Um, so we'll go ahead and build a program to address that uh, in just a moment. We'll talk about like what exercises are actually gonna be good for this. Um, but questions on that anatomy so far, questions, comments, concerns about sort of what's going on here, guys. What, what, uh, what page is this in the book? Like, can we see like, Yes, you definitely, definitely can. However, I do not have it memorized and I let a student borrow my book uh, that I will be getting back tomorrow. <laughs> um, I do not have it directly on me, but it will be in the okay. assessments chapter. Um, go to, I got my table of contents here um, because of exactly this problem. Go to chapter 12. Uh, and it will be in the static postural distortions section of chapter 12. Um, and that's where you'll find every one of these examples. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have the page number directly. <laughs> I need which to... book? Is it the essential of the sport or which? Oh, book? oh, oh. And it will be this book here. Always this one. Whenever I, I, if I don't tell you which book directly, I mean, I mean this one every time. The sports book is great. Uh, and that one does it actually, actually, Alexis, I can give you that, that book number. Hold on one second. Cause I can look. Okay. Through. Cause that's the book I had. Yeah. Actually, well, I mean, I have I've both, got a but... digital copy of that book right here. So I can just go straight to the chapter. Uh, it, Cause it is in both. They, they do put it in both of them. Uh, testing. Page 81. All right, past all of that. Uh, so they do go straight to the squat version uh, rather than the static version. Um, yeah, or um, so they're going to go straight to the overhead squat. So you're going to look at the feet turnout knees cave in solution. That will be right on page 108 of the sports book. I need a digital copy so I could pull it up on these freaking Zoom calls. I really wish I had a digital copy of the NASM 7th edition, but like, I'm not even sure that exists yet. Um, <laughs> Cause like, like, I don't even think the digital copy of this book should exist. I don't know how I found this one day, but like I found it on the internet and I was like, Great, I'm taking that because that's good for my Zoom calls. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, 
Okay, so next distortion. Let's go ahead and take a look at what we call lower crossed syndrome, okay? So lower cross syndrome is a static posture that is you know, characterized by the anterior pelvic tilt, okay? So we're seeing the client who has uh, way more anterior tilting uh, than they are, are supposed to, okay? Um, so again, we're gonna kind of zoom in on this here. Um, so we're seeing very tight muscles on one side of the joint uh, and very weak muscles on the other, just like we do in any of our postural distortions. Um, but we see this excessive arching, right? And you can feel this on yourself, by the way. Uh, like one way that you can assess this in yourself is just go into a mirror, look in a mirror, uh, reach to the back of your pelvis. You'll feel those two knobs back here, right? If you really just like palpate around, you'll feel those two, these little two bony landmarks. This is called your PSIS. That stands for posterior uh, superior because it's on the top of your pelvis. And then it's on your ilium, which are the big flares on your pelvis. That's the eye, that's the iliac uh, spine, which is the ridge here. So the PSIS is this little knob back here. And then you've got another one that's your ASIS. Uh, that's this little knob in the front. You can feel both of them. Like, you see that? And then, so both of those little bony landmarks there. Um, and ideally, uh, you'll notice like if I go to my neutral posture, um, mine are kind of flat. They're both lining up like just flat with one another. Ideally, they should be ever so slightly offset with the PSIS being up top. An anterior pelvic tilt though is where it's really extreme, right? So we don't want them perfectly flat. We also don't want them uh, excessively forward. Um, we want a, a slight pelvic tilt, okay? Um, so uh, in an anterior pelvic tilt, where it's like very excessive, we call it lower crossed syndrome. It's kind of a weird term for that, but what we mean is that like the lower portion of their body is actually experiencing a cross. There's tight muscles here in the back up high and tight muscles here in the front down low. And then the exact opposite true, we've got weak muscles down low in the back and weak muscles up high uh, in the front. So it makes an X, you know, weak to weak, tight to tight. Um, that's where the, the nickname lower cross syndrome kind of comes from. Um, but let's see here, where'd that picture I, sh I pulled up earlier? I love that picture. Uh, God, it's so close to this one. Like I, I used to use this one all the time, <laughs> but then I got this, like somebody, they, there was a different one I found. And I was like, oh, I like that so much better. Uh, oh, what did I click? <laughs> God dang it. <laughs> Come on, internet, help me out. There's a NASA slide, by the way. <laughs> uh, all right. No. Oh, the internet. So unreliable. <laughs> Has everything, but I can never find it when I need it. All right. Um, so again, we are seeing this rotation happen, right? And that's that's really what we are seeing. We, it's, it's a rotary movement of the pelvis, right? So what we're going to notice is that we're going to see tight muscles uh, that are pulling us down like this. And we're going to see other type muscles that are pulling us um, up like that. Now, you'll notice that they're drawing it like as an arch, but I'm sort of showing you what's happening like in the pelvis here, right? If we consider that our pelvis is kind of this like circle, right? That circle is being pulled like this. Um, so, uh, the weak muscles that we need to strengthen would be exactly the opposite, right? They would normally pull us this way and they would normally pull us down, pull us down this way, right? Those are the muscles that are, are weakened, right? So what's causing this, if we look at like tight to tight here, right? Um, we are seeing tight muscles from here. Oops, that's supposed to be a line. Uh, we're seeing tight muscles from like here to here traveling through. 
and we're seeing tight, uh, weak muscles, um, ah, weak muscles from here to here as it travels through. And that's where that X really comes from, right? So our probable red probable overactive muscles are going to be a lot of hip muscles here, right? Um, we are going to see this listed as the hip flexor complex. So lower cross syndrome, it just says hip flexors, which is good, but it's not very descriptive because your hip flexors is, uh, it's a pretty big complex of muscles. So I'm going to write um, hip flexor complex. Um, but what I mean by that is I mean that's the TFL, that's your tensor fascia latte. So that's the same muscle we just saw on our last list, right? That's the one that was internally rotating the hip. It does both. It's primarily a hip flexor and an internal rotator. Uh, we're also going to see tightness in the ilio psoas. Uh, that's your, that's known as your iliacus and your psoas muscle. Um, uh, and then we're going to see the big one here, the rectus femoris, right? So the rectus femoris um, is actually a quadriceps muscle as well. Um, so that's all of the hip flexors. And then we're going to see our lumbar extensors is how they've got it listed here. Um, that is going to be your what's known as erector spinae. So lumbar extensors, which I'm, what I mean by that uh, is the erector spinae or erector spinae, as you'll hear people say it sometimes. Um, so those are our probable overactive muscles, okay? Um, so if we, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some of that anatomy, right? Uh, hip flexor complex. Take a look here. You can see it's a lot of muscles all coming together um, all at once. Uh, where did that picture just go? There we go. That's the one I wanted. <laughs> um, so uh, there's actually a couple of different muscles ha happening here. You can actually see um, some of it is, like I said, it's the iliacus. Uh, and the psoas muscles. So the iliacus is this one right here. It lives on the inside of your, your pelvis there, and then it runs down and grabs your femur. And then this one, this big long one here, that's your psoas, okay? So that muscle also runs through. And you'll notice it runs through this little bit of like this fascia line right here, um, kind of threads down and grabs that. So those two are the ones that are very responsible for driving your hip up like this. Now imagine if... I pulled my hip up like this and then tied like a string from here to like one of my spinal discs, right? Like I pull it up like this and I just tie a string. Strings can't stretch. So what ends up happening when I drop my leg down, it pulls my pelvis forward, right? Like it's gonna be ripping it down like this. And that's why this is pulling our pelvis down in the front, creating that low back arch, right? Um, the next one that we're gonna see that's also part of that hip flexor complex uh, is going to be the rectus femoris. Uh, it's actually a quadriceps muscle. Um, this is one of your, this is your main quad muscle, but you'll notice it ties into the same spot there, right there on the pelvis. Instead of coming all the way up to the spine, this one's just the very front of your pelvis and it comes down and grabs your tibia here. So that one's running from here all the way down to here. And again, if I like tighten that up, right? it's gonna pull down on my pelvis. So I'm grabbing my pelvis and I'm literally pulling it down like this, making this you know, low back arch. Great for an Instagram photo, if you're trying to show, <laughs> yeah, if you're trying to show off, but not so good for our posture, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? Um, what's the classic like, you know, the classic like selfie pose, people like they take one leg back and they go, boom, you know, like <laughs> not, Good. <laughs> um, and then actually see this muscle right here? It's not colored in, but the one off to the side. Um, that's actually your TFL. 
So again, there's the TFL muscle showing up on a very tight list. Um, this muscle causes so many problems for all of us. <laughs> um, and there it is, there's the TFL. So same spot, grabbing the femur, and then it becomes the IT band down here. Um, so very, 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 very tight. So those are all the hip flexors, right? The iliopsoas, and that's, that's what we got listed here, right? Um, the tensor, I put it in the wrong order. The TFL, um, tensor fascial lissae, iliopsoas, and rectus femoris. All of those are the ones that are tight on the front here. So that is our list that's pulling down in the front, okay? Then we've got our erector spinae or erector spinae. That's all of this musculature here. Now it does run all the way up. Is this part causing problems? Probably not so much. Most of it is gonna be down here in what's called, in like the thoracolumbar fascia area. Um, it's this, this bottom portion down here because it's very fascial. If you look at this, you know, down here, it's all covered up. Can't really see it in this because it's covered up by the lats on the left side. Um, but the right side over here, look at all this musculature that's happening there. So that's causing the tilt. This, remember before we talked about pulling the pelvis down in the front, this is grabbing the back of the pelvis and pulling it up in the back, right? So now if I do both of those simultaneously, there it is, right? There's my, it's like grabbing, you know, it's like a, <laughs> this is what just jumped into my head. I've never said this before. It's like a pirate is on your pelvis and they're just spinning it this way. <laughs> they got the, like, starve, I don't know anything about being a pirate, but like, <laughs> It's grabbing your pelvis and just rotating it the other direction. <laughs> um, so uh, that is, those are all the tight muscles, right? Those are all the muscles that are tightening us up, pulling our pelvis down towards the front. So again, you know, we see, uh, we're gonna see a, see a line from here to here. So there's the X, right? There's the, the tight muscles there. Now, how do we fix it? Let's flip to the other side of the joint. Underactive muscles, there it is again. Again, this is also gonna be on every freaking list. Gluteus maximus needs to be strengthened. Shocker, you know, we're working on our glutes. So gluteus medius and gluteus maximus are both gonna to need to be strengthened here. Um, so our probable underactive muscles Open that up. Are going to be the gluteus maximus, the gluteus medius. For the record, the gluteus medius, um, the only reason that's on the list, your gluteus medius doesn't do a lot of hip extension, but it does kind of assist with it. Um, so getting them both strengthened can have a positive effect um, because it's just simply an antagonist. Uh, and then we'll see the hamstrings as well as the abdominals. Now, this is another example of me not loving the fact that they just simplified this and they called it the abdominals. Um, that makes you think that like doing crunches will fix this problem. And it can have a somewhat positive effect. But you gotta remember that crunching is like, is, is spinal flexion that's curving your spine, right? You're crunching. That's not what we're seeing here. We're seeing the pelvis move up. So the part of the spine that we need to, or the part of the core that we need to strengthen uh, are your core stabilizers, not your core movers. Um, so that's gonna be like, uh, and this is gonna get to be a long list here, uh, but the transverse abdominus, the internal, crap. <laughs> Uh, the internal obliques, the multifidus, um, pelvic floor muscles, and diaphragm. Um, now, that's a pretty big working list. 
Um, that's the, the definitely the more advanced list. Uh, every one of these muscles are the parts of your spine that don't move your spine. They're the parts of your spine that are responsible for keeping your spine in alignment. So remember, I think I might've been yesterday, maybe the day, uh, maybe it was Friday, but I said, working out, exercising is about human movement. Of course, it's about movement. It is also just as much though about resisting unwanted movement. And that's where these stabilizers come in. These stabilizers are responsible for holding us in place. So um, that's a pretty big list there. Uh, now, these muscles, the gluteus maximus, which we already kind of looked at, and the gluteus medius, which we already kind of looked at, uh, need to be strengthened, as well as the hamstring complex, right? That's going to also pull us downwards. Uh, and then the abdominals are going to be responsible for stabilizing us upwards, okay? Um, so uh, gluteus maximus, right? The main butt muscle there the big one that, that externally rotates as well as like, this is also primarily hip extension. Uh, the gluteus medius, right? That's the one on the side, right? This one here. Uh, and then we see the hamstring complex. Now that one might seem kind of weird because when you think of the hamstrings and you're new to this stuff, uh, oh, come on, Ken Hub. <laughs> Your pictures are the best. Um, this is both hamstrings, one's in green, one's in red here, but, um, there's two sides to your hamstrings. You've got the medial side and the lateral side, both hamstrings in this case need to be strengthened. Um, but you may think it's kind of weird that we're fixing this rotary problem with the muscle that's responsible for this, but you got to remember, yes, it does do this, but it also assists with this. So it works with your glute to also kick straight back. It's not the hamstring's main job, but it is part of its job. It's, it's, it's a sort of an accessory job. So um, these are muscles that we definitely do want to strengthen to, to pull our pelvis straight back. Uh, and then we, if you look at our core stabilizers, um, you know, all of the muscles around the core here that kind of create that, that circle, right? Uh, you got the transverse abdominis, uh, which is the, the front portion, the internal obliques, which is sort of the side portion, diaphragm on top, pelvic floor muscles on bottom, right? That's creating this like stability. Now there's also the back of the box, which is the multifidus. And you'll notice that it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's a weird muscle to have on the list when we have too much rotation. Didn't we just say we have too much strength? in these muscles in our low back? Yes. And until now, we've really been looking at like one side of the joint versus the opposite side of the joint, right? This is left hand's pulling too hard, right hand needs to pull harder, you know, opposite to opposite. However, sometimes in the more complicated problems, it's not always just the straight opposite. It's not always the straight opposite. Sometimes it's like, hey, a helper muscle is pulling and doing something it's not designed to do. And the main muscle needs to be able to do its job. Robin's taking over for Batman and Batman can't do his job because Robin's in the way, right? It's the synergist muscle that's inhibiting the main muscle. Uh, my posterior pelvic tilt problem is my glutes not working hard enough and my hamstrings doing all the work. So it's causing this to pull this way. Um, this helps this. But in my case, this takes over for this, and that's not helping. Um, so in this case, the multifidus is supposed to stabilize the low back. It's a core stabilizer muscle. But the erector spinae is like, hey, I got it. I can do it. I can, I, I'm in the low back. Let me do it. Right. So then it tries to stabilize, but instead it pulls because it's a mover muscle instead of a stabilizer muscle. Um, so that one's probably the most complicated part on the list. That's the one that, that really does kind of like sometimes leave people a little confused because it's like, why would a low back muscle be underactive when we have low back muscles that are too tight, right? But that's the stabilizing low back muscle that's supposed to be, it's supposed to be stabilizing, but instead, um, the other low back muscle is moving it. Um, and that's, that's really what's causing the problems here. So the abdominals are the problem in the front. 
they need to be strengthened. Uh, and then all those hip extensors in the back need to be strengthened as well. Um, does that make sense, everybody? Pretty clear on that? Yep. Cool. I feel like I was drawing like the 90s X-Men logo over here. I made this yellow. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, let's take a look at upper cross syndrome. So upper cross syndrome, uh, is going to be characterized. We're going to notice this as rounded or protracted shoulders uh, and a forward head. So not only is it excessive, you know, remember we have scapular retraction versus protraction. We talked about that yesterday. So we have too much protraction and a forward head posture. So we need to fix that, right? Um, so... This is called upper cross syndrome because it's kind of the same thing. We're also seeing like a little bit of rotary movement here um, in like the shoulder joint where we're seeing uh, this kind of rounding happen, right? Um, we're seeing tight muscles from one side to the other. And that's causing our head to sort of forward reach. So scrolling over to here, upper cross syndrome. We're going to see tightness in these three main muscles. here. Now I will say they're kind of trying to shoehorn in the whole crossed syndrome thing. This X gets a little complicated. <laughs> it's not a perfect, these other ones, it's like, oh, the X was so clear. Like tuh, 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 tuh. this one, it's like some of these are on the side of the body, right? They're over here, which is like kind of hard to show in an X. Um, so the, the, I like what they're doing here, but it kind of breaks down a little bit um, just at the very end. So, uh, boop. so um, let's go ahead and put our probable overactive muscles up here first. So we're gonna see tightness in the upper trapezius and the levator scapula and the sternocleidomastoid. So those are uh, very, very, very tight muscles that we're gonna go ahead and start with. Um, so probable overactive muscles upper trapezius levator scapulae and the sternocleidomastoid that's a fun name by the way everybody calls it the scm but i like to say sternocleidomastoid because it sounds like a dinosaur and I think that's way more fun. Uh, <laughs> hardest muscle to say, super fun muscle to say, but super fun once you get it down. Uh, and then we're gonna see tightness in both of our pec muscles, the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor. I'll say it's mostly the minor, um, but they do both belong on that list. So pectoralis major, and pectoralis minor. So that's our biggest list of tight muscles here. So again, where are we seeing tightness? Well, we're seeing it from back here over to here, right? Uh, and that's causing that rotary movement, right? So which muscles are tight in the back? Well, that's going to be the upper trapezius, which live right here. Uh, that's going to be your levator scapula, which also lives right here. And then the sternocleidomastoid actually lives right here on the side of the neck, but that is part of our backwards list here, right? So we're seeing tightness in those three muscles, and then we're seeing tightness here in both of our pec muscles. So they're going to end up on this side of the list, okay? Um, so that's what's causing that rotary movement. I'm actually going to change my chart here slightly. Um, so, uh, so again, tightness here and tightness here, causing this rotary movement. So the, ah, paint. <laughs> um, so tight. Tight, tight muscles. 
Okay. Um, so let's look at that anatomy. Which one's the upper trapezius? Your upper trapezius is right here in the back. So this is actually all three of your trapezius muscles. Um, it's this portion right here. This section's the middle and this section's the lower. These are actually weak muscles. We actually wanna strengthen these fibers. So the upper trapezius um, are these orange fibers uh, here. Now, actually, you know what? There's, the, there's a picture. Most people just draw them all at once. So it's always really hard to find like a picture of them separate. Um, but these muscles here on the side of the neck and the back, right? You can feel your upper traps right here. You literally just give yourself that classic shoulder rub. That's your upper traps. Those are the shrug muscles that everybody's always trying to build up that I'm always telling people to leave it alone. <laughs> um, then we got our levator scapula. That's this muscle right here. Uh, it also lives in the back under your upper trapezius. So this is grabbing the back of your scapula and it goes up. So it's grabbing these like little spinal processes right here. So it's in charge of, it's in the name, elevating your scapula, pulls your shoulder blades up, which you'll notice when I do that, kind of naturally makes my head want to drop forward. So if I passively just contract this all day, I naturally drop my head forward here. And it's because it's not directly going straight up and down. It kind of goes at an angle. So this dumps my scapula forward like this. When it lifts up, you'll notice it naturally wants to dump my scapula this way um, because it's pulling at a forward angle, right? Just look at like how this would pull, right? It would pull slightly forward and cause a tilt to happen in this scapula. Um, then we see the sternocleidomastoid. That's this muscle right here on the front of the neck. Um, very tight muscle, by the way. If you just poke yourself right here, you'll probably be like, ah, <laughs> very tender. Um, but that's your sternocleidomastoid right there. Um, big jerk of a muscle. <laughs> um, and that's the one I was talking about kind of breaks our analogy because that's still very high. <laughs> um, but it does attach in the back. So that's where, again, the tight muscles being in the back there. Um, Then we've got tight muscles in the pec major and pec minor. Let me get a picture of these two together. There we go. So uh, pec major is the big one over here on the left, and the pec minor is the little one over here on the right. So you'll notice these both grab different places. Um, this pec major grabs your humerus, so your main large pec muscle that we see uh, reaches across and it grabs the humerus. So that's actually causing my shoulder to internally rotate, which you'll notice if I'm standing with a neutral posture and then I just pull, I rotate my arm in. See how that naturally rounds my shoulders? So it's the rotary part of the shoulder that's causing the rounding in this case. Uh, and then the pec minor lives underneath it. It doesn't even touch your humerus. There's your humerus, right? There's your arm bone. Doesn't even touch it. What this is grabbing is the scapula, the shoulder blade. See that little hook right there in this picture? That little hook that comes around the front, that's called your coracoid process. Um, there's the hook on the front. That's what's grabbing it. And that is why the pec minor doesn't actually help with like pressing actions, but it does help with this that little extra push that you'll sometimes see people do, that's your pec minor. So that is scapular protraction. And you'll feel it, push your hand just here and then just bring your scapula forward. Even though this lives underneath the main muscle, you'll still feel that contraction. I'm moving my scapula, not my, uh, not my humerus, right? Not my, not my arm. So those are very tight muscles that are causing that rounding there, right? So we're going to need to stretch all those out. Then we got to talk about what muscles to strengthen. Uh, our probable underactive muscles here in blue. Mm -hmm. 
This is going to be our first one is deep cervical, right? Deep cervical flexors. Uh, our rhomboids. And then our middle slash lower trapezius. Okay, so these are the muscles that are going to pull us back into alignment. So they're going to pull down like this, or they're going to pull our neck up like that. Again, that's going to fix this rotary movement problem that we've got. So our deep cervical flexors, they actually live on the front of the neck. Now that one sometimes confuses people because you're like, wait, 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 wait. Again, that's on the front here. Why is that going to be what fixes this? Well, take a look at where it actually is. It's these little ones attached to our spine directly. This is another example. Actually, whew, there we go. That's a picture that I want. Um, this is another example of a synergist muscle taking over for the main muscle that was supposed to be doing its job. Your deep cervical flexors are what are supposed to help you look down. Okay. Um, so your sternocleidomastoid does this. Look at my head here, right? My sternocleidomastoid does this. My deep cervical flexors do this. And I know that like a lot of people are trying to avoid the whole, you know, double chin thing, but the deep cervical flexors are how we are supposed to look down. Unfortunately, what we generally tend to do is we do this, right? Um, now you couldn't see that. <laughs> Friggin' camera. Uh, I need one of those like Facebook portal things that naturally like follows me around the room. How cool would that be? Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so these deep cervical flexors, they live right on the side of your neck here. And so practicing how to tuck your chin back like this is actually very helpful. Honestly, best exercise you can do to strengthen this is literally just stand against the wall and just reach your head up and back. Just a little bit of that. That's going to help set your head on top, make you look, you know, six inches taller too. Um, what order am I going in? <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> Get a couple extra inches out, right? Um, so then we've got the rhomboids. Um, you know, your rhomboids are a scapular retractor. That one's pretty easy to understand. It's like, oh, we have too much protraction. What am I going to do? I'm going to work on scapular retraction, right? So if I'm doing too much of this, I need to pull it back. So again, rows, right? Rowing and just pinching those shoulder blades back. Um, and actually the exact same thing is true of our middle trapezius. Uh, the middle trapezius, can I get a picture of it by itself? Probably not. Yeah, okay. Um, meh. <laughs> oh, wait, there it is. Um, and the lower trapezius. So both of these fibers, the middle section and the lower section. And look at the way the fibers work, actually. If you look at how they're drawn, uh, where that kind of picture, actually, you know, this one works just fine. Um, see the fibers, guys? The upper fibers were the ones that were tight, rounding us, you know, rounding us forward, doing this kind of thing. So the middle fibers were, were, were what we were supposed to be working. And then the lower fibers, which pull us down. See the angle of that? That pulls down. So again, you always, how many times have you guys heard a group exercise instructor or a trainer say, roll your shoulder blades down and back, right? Like if they happen to be in this position while they're doing their rows, right? We say, roll them back and roll them down. And that puts us back into alignment so that we can use our proper upper back muscles during that rowing action. So those are our underactive muscles, right? Um, you know, we're going to see the deep cervical flexors are going to fix this section. And then the rhomboids, middle trapezius, and lower trapezius. So now we've got a list of what muscles we need to stretch and what muscles we need to strengthen. So let's go back to our first problem here. 
Uh, and I'll go ahead and kill the PowerPoint and kill the notes here. And let's open up a little workout template and sort of write this out. I'm going to do this in class tomorrow. I'm going to be bringing these, these workouts with us. So we're just going to do one of them today. Um, and I'll bring the other ones tomorrow. And that's what we're going to practice uh, in our in-person meetup. We're going to get a chance to kind of do these programs here. Where's my blank? There it is. Um, so here's our OPT template, right? Now, for the record, all this posture stuff, it sounds like a lot of work. Um, it sounds like it's going to take an hour to work on all this. But I want to show you guys how quick this can actually happen. Right. So we're going to look at the first one here. Let's go all the way back to pronation distortion syndrome. Okay. Probable overactive muscles are the gastric nemus, soleus, adductors, and hip flexors. Those are the muscles I need to turn off. So I'm going to start by foam rolling all of those. Okay. So I'm going to go SMR. That's foam rolling in this in, in our example. We'll say foam roll. Right? I could say SMR. I, I usually just say SMR because maybe use a lacrosse ball, you know, doesn't always have to be just a foam roll. Maybe use a massage gun. I got nothing against that, right? Um, so we're going to SMR the gastric nemus, soleus, adductors, and TFL. I'm going to put TFL rather than putting hip flexors overall, okay? We're just going to focus on the TFL tomorrow. Well, we're going to do all of it tomorrow, but for this one, we'll focus on that part, right? That is going to be one to two sets. So I'm going to pick one set. Uh, I'm going to go 30 seconds each for each movement, right? Um, and then I'm going to do a static stretch for each of these. So now I've inhibited the muscle. I've turned the muscle off. Now I'm going to lengthen it out so it doesn't turn back on. So I'm going to do a static standing gastric nemia stretch. That's what it's called in your book, by the way. Um, I'd probably just say, a uh, I would say a static runner stretch, um, but that's the, that's this one right here. Okay. And that'll stretch the upper portions of the cap. Then I'm going to do a static standing soleus stretch, right? That's the one with the bent, same stretch, but with a bent knee. Uh, then we'll do a static standing adductor stretch and a static uh, standing TFL stretch. So I've got four stretches to pair with my four tight muscles here, right? We go with the gastric nemus first. That's this one. Uh, we go with the soleus second. That's this one. We go with the adductors third. It should be this one, right? That lunge stretch. I'm stretching on my adductor over here. And then we got the TFL. Now, like I said, your TFL is a hip flexor and it's a, an internal rotator. So how do I stretch it? I do the opposite. I go into hip extension and I externally rotate. And then I kind of lean away and that'll help as well. The leaning part, by the way, is actually for those iliopsoas, just because they might share some fascia. <laughs> so the leans, not as important actually. Um, so there is my warm up. And now I just throw my client on, let's say, you know, a uh, spin bike for five minutes, right? So again, I'm going to do one to two sets. So I'm going to pick one for everything. Uh, and I'm going to do 30 seconds on each of those stretches because a static stretch should be held for 30 seconds. And then we'll do like five minutes on the spin bike. And there we go. I just addressed all the tight stuff in red. I just wrote a program. I just wrote a program for all the red stuff. So now I need to switch to the other side of the joint and I need to work on the underactive stuff. So I need to strengthen my anterior and my posterior tibialis. So what we're going to practice. This, sorry, one second, is a strengthening exercise for the anterior tibialis. So that's going to be called resisted dorsiflexion. Okay. Resisted dorsiflexion looks like this. This is going to be hard for me to show you guys. So I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to Google this one. <laughs> and I'll make her show you. <laughs> um, 
So this little exercise right here, you can even see, look at her shin. There's the anterior tibialis muscle firing underneath her skin, right? So that's the resisted dorsiflexion. Then for the posterior tibialis, we're going to strengthen that one as well. So this is resisted inversion. So he's going to keep his knee planted. He's going to keep his knee locked rather. And he's going to pull in just like that. And that's going to work on that posterior tibialis. There's also another, you know, you can do that one. Um, so again, oh, good, an ad right in the middle. Uh, <laughs> just like that, right? So pulling that way. Uh, there's also some really good ones where you can also do like the scoop. So you can see they're actually, rather than keeping their foot planted, they're also doing the scoop. That can be really helpful if you need more inversion, which is probably the one we'll end up doing tomorrow. Uh, I like this one the best, actually. Um, but unfortunately, it kind of requires a little bit of help. Um, so when I give my clients homework, I do the other one. When I'm there, I do that one. So we're going to do uh, resisted eversion, uh, inversion. Okay. Uh, then we need the gluteus medius and the gluteus maximus. So uh, let's go with the uh, good core exercise for the gluteus maximus. Um, let's go with a core exercise. We'll go um, uh, floor bridge with abduction. So that's the, the floor bridge with the resistance band around the knees. Um, so like that, that's gonna be a really good one. And then we will go with the, we'll get a little balance exercise in there. Uh, we'll go with a single leg balance with reach and then uh, uh, lateral and transverse. Uh, I know you guys probably don't know those names just yet if you're new. Um, heck, you might not even be super familiar with those names if you've been with me for a while because that is a very NASA name for stuff. Um, but uh, the single leg balance with reach is this. I'm standing on one leg and I'm reaching with my other leg. In the textbook, the baseline version is all three planes of motion, sagittal, frontal. And then you'll notice I'm not just going posterior, I'm swinging it. See how I externally rotated my hip? Uh, that's transverse, right? So sagittal, frontal, transverse. Uh, our client doesn't have problems in the sagittal plane. So uh, what I said was frontal and transverse only. So these two. So I'm just going to go frontal and transverse. So now I've activated all of their under act, uh, active muscles that will hopefully what did I do? Uh, that will hopefully um, draw us back into alignment with these exercises. So we're going to do kind of a basic version because uh, we're going to have three programs to get through tomorrow. So I'm going to go two sets on everything. For the resisted dorsiflexion, we'll go with 12 reps. The inversion will go with 12 reps. That's going to be each, by the way. Uh, the floor bridge with the abduction, we'll do 20 of those. Oh, that'll be fine. Uh, and then the balance with reach will go uh, uh, six each because that'll be 12 uh, total. Uh, tempo is going to be slow for all of these. We want to focus on learning how to contract properly. Uh, we'll take zero seconds of rest on each of these and we'll do 60 seconds at the end. So we'll do it as a circuit. So we're just being a little bit more time efficient. Um, and then I would write, and now that I've done all that, now that I've like, you know, uh, addressed my clients, like overactive muscles, I got the right stuff turned on. I got the right stuff turned off. Now I can just write a standard workout. You know, let's say I'm training, uh, let's say I'm training Daryl, right? And he's like, I want to, you know, leg day. I want to get better at barbell squats. I want to get better at deadlifts. Great. Here's my resistance selection, right? Barbell squat, barbell deadlift. Let's put some lunges in there, walking lunges, All right? Let's put um, uh, uh, one last little extra. We'll go step up um, to balance, right? There we go. Now I can write like a regular old standard workout. Maybe it's like four sets, eight reps. But if you, 
if he was a knee cave in client, you know, prior to this, this stuff is going to get the right stuff turned on. And he's going to go into his barbell squat and be like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm in a lot. This feels so much easier. And it's because like, yeah, we shut down the stuff that was pulling too hard and we turned on the stuff that wasn't pulling enough and it naturally pulled us into alignment. So as much as we do want to get to the resistance section, I'm going to leave that out of tomorrow's workout uh, because we're just, you know, we got a lot to get through tomorrow. So we're going to do three sort of mini routines. Um, this will be the first one. Uh, and then I will have a copy of this for you guys. What I'm going to do uh, is when I email this to you tonight, um, cause I need to replace these. I need to replace them with the, the new versions. Um, so the version that's up on canvas now, uh, I'm going to replace that, but I'm going to go SMR gastric nemius, and it will have links to these images. Um, so it'll look like this. And that way you guys can see this routine. Um, you can download it. And if you click, and so I'm gonna close, I'm gonna close all my internet stuff now. Um, let's say I click this, boop, and there it is. And you guys will have a copy of this um, that you can sort of practice with. Um, but we'll get a chance to actually do these routines tomorrow. Um, because obviously, you know, this is all well and good if I'm like, and there you go. You know, like, <laughs> um, but we don't want to do that. We want to, we want to actually practice them. Um, but yeah, I'll have this all written out and it will, the, the program will be in your email tonight. I will print them for you tomorrow. Um, uh, and that's it. That's, that's today's lesson guys. I know it was a little weird. We got off the PowerPoint a little bit. Um, this lesson is kind of like a weird in between lesson. Uh, but it very much will be capitalized on tomorrow. It'll all kind of piggyback tomorrow. Um, questions, comments, concerns, guys. How y'all feeling? Wow. So good. <laughs> a lot of information. <laughs> yeah. Three routines in one day. A lot of information. Yeah. Three routines in one day is a lot, a lot. Um, that's why the rest of the six days, um, don't get me wrong, we do have to talk about how to get through how to take a, a subjective like questionnaire. Um, we gotta talk about how to measure our clients if we're doing like, you know, um, circumference measurements, cardio assessments, and then all of this stuff that we just went through today, we are gonna go through it again over the next like six full days, just dedicated to just this in general. So it is a lot, but to think of today as like one giant intro slide, you know? Um, we'll make it clearer and clearer as we go through the rest of these routines. Hey, when is, when is homework due? Was it the next day? So I tell people try to get it in the next day. Um, okay. but I don't do hard due dates. You don't get graded down for, for turning them in late. Um, everybody's got different schedules, you know, um, people get COVID, uh, <laughs> like okay. stuff, life gets in the way, you know? Um, so I don't do super hard due dates, but I also do not slow down when I give homework out. It is every two days. So if you get super far behind, eventually you're gonna lose a weekend. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I, my advice is to try to aim for the next day. Um, also, to, to, tomorrow the midterm test is going out. Um, I don't do hard due dates on that either, by the way. Um, but if you don't do homework one and two leading into the midterm, you're gonna struggle on the midterm. You know what I mean? Um, exactly. So I don't really have like a black and white answer for you. Um, yeah, I was just making sure because I was going to do it the day after. Like we had it yesterday, so I was going to do it today. But totally. so. that's that's a great way to do it. Cool. Uh, but ask anybody in here who's been with me for more than one mod, and I'm sure everybody has at least one time been like, uh, you know, ah, my cell phone lost, you know, uh, the, the bill got screwed up and I couldn't do my, you know, and it's like something happened and then like, if you were already behind, it, it, it catches up to you very quickly. Um, so my advice is always the within two days. Um, but I know that like um, some of you guys, um, you know, I know some people wait until the weekend to just do it all at once on the weekends. I have nothing against that, you know? Um, just don't get super far behind. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's kill it and- uh,
Yeah, um, really oh, no, no, no. I just told you. I have a question after. After. Uh, oh, yeah. sure. Okay. Yeah. Let me uh, kill the recording.